most of the people that hire me know that I'm a dowser. And uh, they don't care. Most of the time the client doesn't care. I could come out here with a dead chicken and throw it in the air. If I find water, that's what matters to them. And based on the track record that I have, um, I mean, you can look up the wells I found. Uh, that's why people hire me. I was a geology major, so I got out of school and started doing environmental geology. I'd get done all my scientific studies, you know, and I'd tell the client, this is where I want you to drill. And the guy would say, wow, you see that stick right over there? Well, that's where my dowser said. And obviously, after seeing that about a dozen times, I started to wonder, what, what is this dowsing stuff? You can find dowsers everywhere, especially where they have a hard time finding water. <laughs> My name's Wayne Thompson, and I locate water for a living and have for some 45 years with Weeks Drilling and Pump Company. Okay, now I'm gonna. The well that they have for this house is contaminated, and uh, the house just sold. Uh oh, I don't like that. <laughs> All right. All right, all right, that's enough, that's enough. Oh, hi! I wanted to come up and knock on the door, but uh, <laughs> Wayne Thompson's my name from Weeks Drilling and Pump Company. Oh, hi, how you doing? As soon as we can get a rig out here, we will, because I know it's, your water is... Yeah, yeah, we yeah. just... Be sure if water. you have any drinking water, Ooh. boil it. And right here is where it's at. There's uh, many, many dowsers uh, throughout the area, of uh, this area plus every other area that I've ever been in. And uh, any place that they have to drill for water, there's going to be dowsers. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> in Ghana, West Africa, and uh, everybody was getting their water out of the river. We had a small welfare farm there, and uh, so we needed some water, and so I doused and found the water very shallow. Where is a big fracture coming through the valley? Where is it? Where is a big fracture coming through the valley? They can come up with all kinds of explanations as to why it works. Frankly, I don't, don't give a damn <laughs> because I know it works, and it's worked for me for so many years that, you know, it's just second nature. I just know it works. You can't just say, oh, well, it just works, period, because there must be an answer to the question, what fact about the water under the ground is such that it relates to my fingers so that when I hold the stick here, I feel the pull of the water. What's the mechanism? Well, what makes dowsing work is the magnetic force running through the ground sets up an electrical charge that's got a positive and negative side to it. One side is negative, one side is positive. This one well, well driller's wife always got the opposite dire direction to what I did. He said, well, she's wired like a Ford and you're wired like a Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the diviners now are sophisticated enough to, to realize that the source of the movement is the actual person's muscles. The dis disagreement is the, uh, what's causing the muscles to do that. And uh, again, most, dowsers, uh, most sophisticated defenders of dowsing, the reality of it, will, will argue that it's the human mind that is in your subconscious, but the subconscious has access to psychic and other kinds of hidden sources of information. Your subconscious causes the muscles to move, but the information comes to your subconscious from outside. And probably the principal teaching in Buddhism is that separation is an illusion. 
that our consciousness has access to everything that is and we're not limited by either space or time. It's as though we have a psychic internet that's available. All the religions have as their purpose to try and find a way to let you communicate with God. So it's as though what they're providing you with is some kind of sacramental software, each with the same purpose, to let you make this connection. But the goal is to allow you to go from your own little mind, your small mind, as the Buddhists would say, to the large, large, small self, to the large self, to uh, achieve this connection. Possibly, there's a perturbation in the Earth's magnetic field sufficient to induce a, a voltage here, shortening the muscle, causing that to do that. That was, that was my approach. <laughs> and I proposed it to the government, and uh, they ultimately did put up some money to fund that idea. So I got a cesium vapor magnetometer, which is uh, the ultimate in measuring magnetic field. We subsequently then conducted a series of tests to correlate magnetic field changes with the dowsing reaction. And we found that there definitely was a correlation. Right here, we buried a, a small piece of iron, 23 out of 25 people that took the test got a reaction within three feet of this spot. And if you say, what's the probability of that? Why well, it isn't one in 100,000? Say that that's pure random. Christ said, the kingdom of God is within you. And my opinion, what, what he meant by that is that the whole universe is accessible to your consciousness. That if you quiet your mind, then you can experience all that is, including your community of spirit, which many people call God. We feel our way through the world constantly. We've got our antennae out there all the time. And as you become more aware of it, you are able to use it better. Now this is what my grandfather told me. He says, you don't hunt water, you seek it. You hunt animals. <laughs> he says, what you're hunting will run from you. <laughs> what you're seeking, you're attracting it. I, I liken the, the human's ability to, to sense this to the bee, the honeybee. If you move their hive two feet, he can't find it. And yet he's been 10 miles away. He comes back to his home and it's been moved two feet, he'll never find his hive. And so if you move a beehive, you have to move it just inches a day to keep from confusing him. Well, he's got a super sensitive homing device there. So does a, so does a homing pigeon that'll come 70 miles. And so somehow we may be endowed with these, you know, whether they're survival instincts or whether they're uh, or just what, I don't know. But I think that's what we're dealing with here in dowsing, is that that's a definite possibility. Now you're putting the cart before the horse. The thing is, is it working? Does it detect anything? Is there anything really there? And any test that has ever been done of dowsing is shown, no, it's not there. Instead of going for the theory, let's go for whether or not there are any results. Do we have a phenomenon here? The answer is no, it's not there. So never mind the explanations as to how it could work if it did work. When you think about dowsing as being quantifiable, you have a difficult time because it isn't necessarily something that is purely quantifiable. So we can make all Even the claims that we want. If you don't quantify them, you can make all the claims you want, as, as outrageous as they may sound.
Dowsers act as if water is hard to locate, and that it's in rare little pockets or rivulets that you have to find very careful uh, work. In fact, uh, at a certain level, the water exists as a water table. And so if you dig deep enough, you dig into the water table, you can find water almost anywhere. Ninety-four percent of the Earth's surface has water within drillable distance. My challenge to the dowsers has always been, find me a dry spot. But they don't want to do that because their chance of success is about six percent. And um, they don't want to work with those odds, I believe. People say that you can hit water any place. And then you take a man out there with a drill rig and he puts a hole in the ground and gets you a four or five hundred foot dry hole. And then maybe he moves over and puts you in another four or five hundred foot dry hole. Then they phone me up and ask me to show them where they can get some water and I get them water. I don't have any argument and I don't care what the guy says about I can't prove one way or another. If he wants to hire me, I'll show him. If he doesn't want to hire me, well, I have no argument with the guy. This is the kind of attitude that scares you. I believe in spite of the evidence that's been offered me. I don't want the evidence. I don't want to know it. I'd rather continue to believe. When you meet a skeptic, shake his hand, you know, buy him a sandwich and make the best of it and put your mind elsewhere. Because they have an emotional reason somewhere to hang on to skepticism. A normal person isn't skeptical. You're dealing with a sickie right there if he is skeptical. I have in this um, bound book here in my hand the uh, records of the 2000 Club, as we call it. And in here are pledges from 15 different countries around the world, from uh, over 300 people who have pledged a minimum of $1,000 apiece to total $1.1 million. The foundation here itself will guarantee that amount of money to anyone who wins the challenge. The challenge is very simple. Do what you say you can do. Now, if you're a dowser, show us that you can actually locate something by means of a dowsing device or your hand or whatever you wish to use uh, satisfactorily under test conditions. We've tested this all over the world. Our big test was done in Castle, Germany a couple of years ago, and we had uh, 13 dowsers who came from all over Europe in response to an advertisement. We had a pipe buried in the ground, and either water flowed in it or didn't flow in it, according to a randomizing technique. They got, at the end of three days of testing, exactly chance results. It would seem to indicate that dowsing as a force simply does not exist except in the imagination and in, in wishful thinking of the people who try it. Well, that's bad logic, because most science can't be tried under scientific conditions. Astronomy, you can't do an astronomy experiment in the lab. Geology, most science is outside of, the, of laboratory conditions to begin with. So I claim those people aren't scientists. As a magician turned investigator, I know two things and know them very well and very thoroughly. How people are deceived and how they deceive themselves. Both of those are important, but the second was much more important than the first. I say they're religious fanatics where their religion is their belief system. And anything that doesn't fit their belief system doesn't exist. Which is essentially what they told you, isn't it? Um, dowsing doesn't fit in my belief system, therefore it doesn't exist. Now isn't that religion? <laughs> well, the difference between science and religion is that science is a process that involves collecting data and reasoning analytically from your data to a hypothesis. Religion in involves belief in something. So there's a fundamental difference, not an antagonism, but it's a difference. I think it's worth pointing out that it was only in a very deeply Christian culture that science originated. And does it have uh, conflicts? Yes, but I would say it's the conflicts of a of a, a child and his parent. <laughs>
<laughs> and hopefully they can be resolved peacefully. But if you think there's not going to be any conflict, well, you came from a different household than most people did. You need to prove everything because that's I the way you're headed. I'll just say that it's, I, I, no, no. I have a certain point that I go to and I, that I know that I can p participate in and without, and feel comfortable about. And beyond that, I feel uncomfortable. So I, whenever I feel uncomfortable, I have the right now to. And we found stop. there's another advantage, and that is I have a door. And when I practice, <laughs> and when I practice my banjo, I can close the door, and he can go to sleep. Always been there. And he can sl he can go to sleep in front of the TV any evening he wants to, and I can practice the banjo, which works just fine. All right. Okay, beautiful. That's how you steer a straight course. Yeah, you, you have to have separation in your togetherness. Science and religion are never going to be compatible in any respect. One is a mythology. It's uh, a pleasant idea. It's much more comfortable than facing hard facts, like the mortgage, the tire that's got the slow leak in it, all of these things that we have to deal with in our lives. Science, on the other hand, is a serious and sincere attempt to find out what makes the world work. There's an old saying that for those who understand and believe, there's no proof necessary. For those that don't believe, no amount of proof will convince them. No amount of evidence, no matter how good it is or how copious it is, is ever going to convince them that it doesn't happen. Well, I guess you do have parents that are a little different. <laughs> because of Dad's amazing ability uh, business-wise, I was able to spend a lot of time doing things that would be enhancing for children. I felt that one of the most important things for a child to learn was expression in any number of ways, which included music. I insisted that you boys learn music to the point where you could sight read so that you could be literate enough to be able to go on and enjoy it. I gave up at a very early age on your part, on Nathaniel's part, that you were going to be engineers, or, or, right? and that was just not was in the card, and that was fine. I mean, everybody has their own thing. But you did have to leave this household knowing how to work. Your mother was off with these es esoteric, artistic uh, ventures. And, uh, and, you know, I think you had to, uh, my, my role, I thought, in terms of your education, it was to teach some practical things. You had to be able to know if the car sounded like it was running right or wrong. <laughs> uh, you had to be able to change a tire and change oil and uh, go out and gather firewood and uh, know that you had to work a little uh, to, towards the, towards the well-being of the household. Yeah, I don't know, I felt that I, my role wasn't as pleasant sometimes as, as her role. Didn't you drill a well around here before? And yeah. Right next door, 500 feet and two gallons a minute. Really? So is that what you expect to find here? Pretty much. 500 feet? 500 feet and around two gallons a minute, yeah. we hope. <laughs> Seriously, we at the Foundation have, uh, have been looking at this in some alarm for years now. And uh, I'm thoroughly convinced, and I don't exaggerate my thoughts on the thing at all, I'm thoroughly convinced that we are well into a second set of dark ages. We really are. We have alternative medicine being studied seriously with budgets like $30 million to investigate how much pressure chiropractors place on the spine, whether acupuncture can help postmenstrual syndrome and whatnot. Uh, homeopathy is being accepted. We have senators and congressmen who are pouring money into all sorts of claptrap. We have entered a second dark ages at this point, and we'd better start to become conscious of it. It's very frightening that we are abandoning rationality. But it's very popular today to know nothing, ask no questions, and believe everything. 
That's the style of the day. That's PC, politically correct, and it can be our downfall. Maybe you should ask Paul Sebony. During World War II, I was a glider pilot. I saw a sign on the bulletin board saying, become a glider pilot in 14 weeks. So I said, went in and saw the first sergeant, and I said, uh, who do I have to see to do this? He says, you want it, you got it. <laughs> We had about 20% casualties in every invasion. In my last tour of duty, I was in one of the first 20 teams of military that learned to assemble the A-bomb. 115, 114, 113, 112, 112 feet deep. How often do you go out down there? Oh, I went every day last week, including Friday, Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> Here's the names and addresses of everyone I've dollars for. I had some people from the uh, Chicago Tribune come by once, and uh, I had them take some names and go out and check me out. And they came back three days later and they said, well, they had checked uh, 12 of the 15 people that, I, that they'd taken the names down from and said, uh, we believe you know what you're doing, but if you can do this wonderful thing, how come you're not rich? <laughs> I said, what makes you think I'm not rich? <laughs> Being retired, I wasn't really hurting for money. I thought, well, I'll douse and take donations and give the money to different projects. And I'm up to a little over $110,000 in donations. Wow. And that's mostly for children's programs. The County 4-H Foundation, the State 4-H Foundation, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. I just feel good about doing, doing something for the town that I grew up in. When I first started dowsing, there were more skeptics everywhere than, than you could shake a stick at. But now, uh, with 3,500 wells in the immediate area here, they're, they're not laughing at me. They're, they think I can help them, and I do. The skepticism is gone, at least <laughs> around here. that even though we, we don't know what they are, we don't understand them, and we can't put our finger on them, we have to go by blind faith, I believe the most important questions can only be answered that way. And your mom has a great reputation for dowsing in this area, so she is the best choice. Your mother's doing damn good. Unless she's given it up, I don't know. She just about did for a while. Yeah, I, uh, uh, losing your brother, mister. Yeah, didn't I thought she was going to go off the deep end. Boy, oh boy, I'm telling you. That poor soul. It, uh, it really was bad. Well, of course it was bad. It's a very, very sad thing. When Nathaniel died, it was devastating, absolutely devastating. I had no reason to be alive anymore. There is a great fracture that has happened in the modern world in which science has presented a whole world without value. That is, it just says, well, we're not making any values, we're just saying, here's what the nuclear bomb does.
I couldn't eat. My weight went way down. And Jim would make sure that I have something to eat. I, I just, I don't know, I would have faded away to nothing. All these people try to make out how wonderful it is that we have this wonderful scientific worldview. Uh, I don't think it's such a, an attractive view. It just happens to be true. I mean, the idea that um, basically uh, we consist in these few bits of matter, and when it goes, we go. But that at death, we simply cease to exist. And worse yet, all the people we love will, at the moment they die, simply cease to exist. Now, that's disgusting. I, I, don't, I can't accept that, but the fact is, as far as we know, that's how the world works. I'd like to believe that our fate is going to be something other than just sort of meaningless perpetuation followed by extinction, but that's not what science tells us. Science isn't going to give us that. Honey, the body is nothing but a vehicle. I've been at many births and many deaths, and when they die, that last breath, that vehicle is nothing anymore. So this body is nothing but a vehicle that the soul rides around in while it's here. I think that the main reason Jim and I pulled through this whole thing was that we did it together. Matter of fact, it was a team. And had it not been that way, uh, it would have been another story entirely. It's not that you get over it because you don't. But as far as I'm concerned, we have a huge gift of life. And if we don't make it as, as the most we can, in whatever way we've chosen to make it, then we've sort of uh, wasted an awfully nice gift. And I'm not saying you choose to make it a, a cheerful, positive, upbeat life all the time. But what you don't do is not do what you can. Go grab life. It's your, your one shot you know you've got right now. Go for it. I decided I'd like to try to see if I could ride a Harley. And I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it. Now he had had, Jim had had a lot of experience riding motorcycles a long time ago. He also understands engines. So he took the course with me. His strengths and my strengths are very different, but they are both strengths. And sometimes we frustrate each other terribly because I don't get why he doesn't see my point of view. He doesn't get why I don't see his point of view. But when we put it all together, it adds up to greater than some of the parts. I would sort of hope, since most dowsers are of advanced years, um, that maybe we're going to see the end of it eventually. But you look around, I look at conventions and whatnot, and I, I get letters from, from kids who have discovered that this sort of thing seems to work for them, and they embrace it. My friends think it's wonderful. They love it. They think it's amazing. There, there are so many people, you know, make fun of that. Make fun of dowsing? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people when they make fun of you? Well, if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. That's all I can say. drilled this well. It was a nice summer day. It was warm. It was hot. I kept coming and checking on the depth of the well and thinking dollar signs. We were very anxious. What I'm getting is that he will need to go down 301 feet. He should be getting around six, six and three quarters gallons a minute. 
you drill a well around here before? And yeah, right next door, 500 feet and two gallons a minute. Really? So is that what you expect to find here? Pretty much. 500 feet. 500 feet and around two gallons a minute. We hope. Seven feet deep. 397 feet. And six gallons a minute. We get six gallons a minute, and the water is good. It's, it tastes delicious. They have a good well. They have a real good well. Everything went, went, we were pleased. Everything went well. in the scientific field, like the nuclear weapons program, you had to show me that something would work before I'd believe it. As a matter of fact, I even had to go to some of the explosions out in Nevada to, <laughs> to watch them go off and experience them before I really was convinced that that little thing would make such a big bang. But since I got into dowsing, I've changed my way of thinking 180 degrees. Now I believe Anything will work until you prove that it won't. <laughs> it's a good way to live. I'd like to say this. Well, let's just put it this way. The people at the dowsing convention laugh a lot more. They have a much better time than the people who are intensely scientific. So my feeling is I'd rather go where, where it's happier. I mean, I know what it's like to be miserable. I know what it's like to cry your guts out. But I don't want to do that. I would rather do something happy, and that's why the banjo and bluegrass music, and that's why the that kind of dowsing I'm doing. I'd rather choose to be happy. If uh, someone just came to you at age 25 said, I just got married, and my wife just started dowsing, and I don't know, I don't know what the hell is going on here. Well, I'm trying to figure out something to this, not something to this. Pyrophone. <laughs> What's more important in a black and white movie, black or white? And I would say that I think that, uh, that both black and white are necessary, so I would say in a similar way. I think it's that, if you will, the interplay between the two of them that, that makes us alive. And uh, therefore, I don't know that I want to <laughs> select one or the other. Thank you. <laughs> Indigo Felix is the slogan on the little round emblem. It means the fruitful search. The thing is, is uh, Dowser was actually my favorite member of Sha Na Na. He was all went. <laughs> that was actually a dowsing maneuver. Oh. He was finding hair gel. Next thing you know, you know they'll be breaking down on dowsing during the SATs. Excuse me, ma'am, have you been dowsing for the answer to this? No, sir. But you got a perfect score. Well, I must be a genius. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> it could happen. When there's a, a definite need, it's going to work. Nonsense. I'm trying to take the nonsense away. I'm not the nonsense. They are. I'm convinced if you have an open mind and really go after something, you can get it. So are we looking at another 20 years? Oh, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but now we've got a banjo to play with it. So you go, so what? So what? Who says it has to be a resolution? No, I'm just curious. If you have everything all organized and all completely set 
and neat and orderly and in line, then you might as well be dead. <laughs> Dad would like to have things all organized, no, no, no. all in line. Okay. He'd have, like to have dinner at 6 o'clock, uh, the house immaculate, and me looking nice and neat and orderly. And I would be so bored, I would not even be able to breathe. So so I guess he likes me the way I am. He doesn't want to really change so me that much, right? Neat and orderly means that there are certain times when it would be nice if you do your dowsing out there and we can have a drink in here. <laughs> well, I didn't know we had. Yeah, well, how many dowsing calls did we get yesterday? I was. We, None. We, we plenty of water this year. We had luck, you know. Yeah, but we had plenty of water. Well, next year when we had the drought. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll year 2000 when all the power goes off. Oh, yeah, that's right. The <laughs> world comes to an end. Oh, what yes. What happens then? I have a well, question. Dozens are going to be in the forefront of everything. I'm now, does, what does the year 2000 mean to you? Does it mean everything is going to change? Oh, you better be ready. 